A young man drags a blue-wheeled trash container behind him. Where is he headed? A woman out for her walk. Her thoughts are on seeing her daughter later that evening. Here is the path where the two worlds would collide, and when they do, it will be catastrophic, and no one saw it coming. Before we begin, we would like to send our deepest sympathies to the loved ones of Lindsay Burback, who fell victim to the abominable acts described in this case. 47-year-old fitness lover Lindsay Burbeck from Accrington, Lancashire, England, loved to go for a walk or a run. She'd been doing it for years and loved staying healthy and active. So, on August the 12th, 2019, she headed out around 4 p.m. to get in a walk before her daughter, Sarah, and her boyfriend were to come by for tea at 6 p.m. She started her walk down Burnley Road and then over to Peel Park Avenue, heading towards an area known as the Coppice. It's a wooded area with walking trails in Accrington. Lindsay had gone there many times to get a walk in, so she didn't feel concerned about it as she was on her way. Why would she, when the place was often visited by people with their dogs, families playing ball, and older residents out for a walk or fresh air? There had been another female walking around the coppice at about the same time Lindsay was heading in that direction. Her name was Zoe Braithwaite. She was enjoying her casual summer walk but she suddenly noticed a male with a dark hoodie and warm-up pants on. He had his hands deep in his pockets and was walking on a path close to the one she was on. He was alone and looked really out of place to her. Maybe it was more of a feeling than anything else, but he was acting really odd, as though he was looking for something, as if he was sizing her up. Her senses heightened as she noticed he was closing the gap between the two of them, and he was doing it all too quickly. She felt her anxiety rise and suddenly broke into a run, moving away from him. Zoe wanted to put as much distance between them as possible. She frantically looked for other walkers as she started down the hill. But when she looked back, apparently she had startled him away when she broke into her run, and he had quickly fled in the other direction. Zoe was very lucky that day. She did not realize just how lucky she was until weeks later. The male hadn't left the area at all. He was hiding and watching for someone else to come along. And Lindsay had just walked into the coppice a few minutes later. At 4.30 p.m., Lindsay's phone quit working. No calls or messages would come in or go out. It had either been switched off or broken, but it hadn't been by Lindsay's hand. She just said, I'll see you at six. I love you. <laughs> and that was the last time I saw her. By 6 p.m., Lindsay's daughter, Sarah, and her boyfriend were standing outside of Lindsay's door, knocking but not getting an answer. Lindsay's car was still in the driveway. Sarah had forgotten her spare key at home, so there was no way for them to get in. At around 6.30, a strange-acting young male walks out of the coppice onto Burnley Road. As a matter of fact, it was the same one Zoe Braithwaite had encountered earlier. His jacket was unzipped, chest bare, and the knees of his track pants were wet, as if he may have been doing something strenuous other than a walk or a run. He's captured on CCTV footage as he exited. It would again show that over the next hour and a half, the strange young man would make two trips past the camera that covered the area of the coppice. At 6.55 p.m., he was seen on camera carrying a knapsack. He was then seen at 8.28 p.m. pulling a blue trash bin on wheels, headed towards the Accrington Cemetery four minutes away. Sarah Burbeck had sent her mother several texts with no responses. This was out of character for her mother. There was no way she would change plans without calling or texting, and Sarah was growing very worried as the minutes passed. 
At 11.45 p.m., she and her father returned to Lindsay's residence with a spare key. Sarah had called her father with her concern about mom being gone and not responding to calls or texts. When they arrived at the home, they searched through the whole house, but no one was there. Everything appeared to be normal. Nothing was out of place. Nothing was disturbed. At 12.11 a.m., August the 13th, 2019, Tim, Lindsay's ex-husband, would call the police, telling them that his ex-wife was missing. An investigation was quickly begun. Tim had met Lindsay in her early 20s on a night out, and it was him and her from that point on. They got along fantastically and enjoyed spending time in each other's company. After years of dating, the two decided to get married. So uh, you were tall, dark-haired, stunning, you know, just everything I liked. When she would agree to meet me again, I thought, winner. We got married three years after we'd been together. Then came along their wonderful children, Stephen and Sarah. Stephen, born June 2000. In October 2002, Sarah was born. One of the outstanding things about Lindsay was that she was a special needs teacher's assistant to children at the Eaton Hill Primary School in Burnley. She worked hard at helping others because she enjoyed it. It meant something to her to be able to change someone's life for the better. Her job couldn't be any more rewarding to Lindsay. Professionally, the work was satisfying, but her private life was a bit different. Things had started to change in her and Tim's married life. They weren't as close as they had been before. Sadly, after 20 years of marriage, they had started to drift apart. Eventually, talk of divorce would work its way into the marriage, and they would separate from each other. We have kind of drifted apart. What I wanted in life and what Lindsay then wanted in life were two different things. The conclusion was we'd split and get divorced. Even though divorce had been inevitable, Tim would remain close to the family. He and Lindsay got along well, and Tim was always there when they needed him for anything. They may have decided to live separate lives, but they would always be a family, and Tim would watch out for Lindsay whenever she needed him just as he was doing on August the 13th, 2019, when Lindsay went missing. People came from all over to help in the search for Lindsay. They met in the coppice to organize searches. This would include help from dog handlers with canines used for tracking. The Lancashire Fire and Rescue Service also was involved, and volunteers with experience in search and rescue added their skills to the search for Lindsay. Many others from the community were willing to give of their time and stepped up to help. Even drones and helicopters were used to search the coppice and surrounding areas. Others worked on the social media angle, and other volunteers made flyers to hand out and place throughout the borough. The police even released the CCTV footage to television of Lindsay walking the route that she took onto the coppice on that fateful day that she went missing. We'd got CCTV that showed Lindsay walking down Burnley Road and we know she turned off onto Peel Park Avenue and that leads to the entrance to the coppice. The coppice is a large hilly area. It's uh, got lots of pathways. It's got lots of trees, it's got lots of foliage. We knew from the family that Lindsay would quite often go running there and would run for miles, and she'd often go walking there. So everything from Lindsay's background and the CCTV was indicating that could be where she'd gone. As August the 19th passed, it would mark one week since Lindsay had disappeared. At the moment, she was still considered a missing person, but every day that came and went would dash the hopes that Lindsay might be found alive. Seeing Stephen and Sarah going through it made it worse. The kids, you can see it in their eyes. They're broken. Everybody were. Have a minute. August the 24th, 2019, Morgan Parkinson was out walking his dog at the Accrington Cemetery when suddenly the dog cut and ran towards a wooded area that was tucked away at the side. 
Parkinson shouted for the dog to return, but she ignored his commands. When he located the dog, she had her head in the cluster of bushes and was sniffing at something interesting to her. Parkinson moved closer and stepped on something squishy and jumped back. He grabbed the dog by the collar and pulled her with him. It was then that a putrid smell hit his nostrils. The smell of something rotten and decaying hung heavy in the air. It was a naked body that had been wrapped in clear plastic and placed in a shallow grave with loose foliage covering it in an attempt to conceal it. August the 24th, 2019 at 7 p.m., Lindsay Burbeck had been found. A missing person's investigation had now turned into a murder and that investigation was officially launched. Local authorities secured the scene and collected evidence, and they sent the remains off for an immediate autopsy. Pathologist Dr. Naomi Carter told investigators there had been an attempt to cut off Lindsay's right leg. This would have been post-mortem after death. Possibly in an attempt to dismember the body, it had been done with a saw. Dr. Carter found evidence of saw teeth marks in the deep laceration that had been cut to the bone and the kneecap. Had the killer been trying to cut up the body for better disposal, but failed? Lindsay had been deceased for quite some time, so it was hard for Dr. Carter to determine the exact injuries as the body was so badly degraded. A body left out in the elements for 12 days would naturally be bloated from natural gases as the organs decomposed, and the color of the skin would go from green to a reddish color due to the blood decomposing as well. Dr. Carter could not rule out any sexual activity due to the decomposition, but Lindsay's fingernails were still intact and could possibly have DNA evidence left by the killer. The pathologist who ultimately examined Lindsay's body wasn't able to rule out there being sexual activity. And I wonder if it was sexual activity the killer was initially seeking as opposed to murder. To me, the murder itself seems to be a byproduct of the killer wanting to engage sexually with a woman. A thorough investigation did reveal significant force had been used to fracture Lindsay's neck, especially to get the crushing damage that was done to the throat area and larynx itself. When the neck is fractured, it can come from severe compression. This can either be through stamping on the neck, severe kicking, or kneeling hard on the victim's neck by the assailant. If there is enough force from stomping, then the neck can break at the C1 juncture, known as a Jefferson's fracture, or at C2, the hangman's break, and the spinal cord can sever. This is called a ligamentous separation of the spinal column from the skull base, and life will cease within a few seconds. Investigators found a yellow-handled saw and a pair of green-colored gloves where Lindsay was located. The items tested positive for blood. The outside of the gloves had Lindsay's DNA on them, but the insides of the gloves contained DNA from an unknown individual that had never been entered into the system. A pair of Skechers athletic shoes, the kind that Lindsay was wearing, were found in a blue plastic bag. Oddly, the soles of the shoes had been cut off and then thrown into the dumpster at the cemetery. The rolling blue trash bin was found, thoroughly analyzed and examined. It was swabbed for trace evidence and positively confirmed that DNA found inside was from Lindsay. Hair had also been found inside, which belonged to Lindsay. As with any murder, the family is always looked at and questioned first. They are the closest to the victims and could have reason to want the victim removed from their life. Lindsay's ex-husband was the first to be looked at. So obviously the police were asking me the questions because I'm the ex-husband. So I say you'd have to be a fool not to think that you're being looked at. Tim Burbeck was thoroughly checked out by the police. He had an alibi and was seen by others and eventually cleared from the investigation. There 
was nothing whatsoever to show that Tim Berber could have been involved in Lindsay's disappearance. And actually, we can show he was elsewhere throughout the time when Lindsay went missing. Now, the police needed to move on and look at all of the evidence they had collected. It could lead them to the real killer of Lindsay Burbeck. As police continued their investigation, one of the officers that had reviewed the CCTV footage found that cameras had captured something that was quite shocking. First, Lindsay is picked up on the camera as she is starting her afternoon walk. Then, there is the video of a young male pulling a blue rolling trash bin behind him. He was headed to the coppice. All this was occurring in broad daylight, but going unnoticed by people walking by. Then, the wheeled bin is brought to the cemetery by the young man. Sometime after that, the young man is captured on video, leaving the cemetery and heading away from the area. He was empty-handed. 16-year-old Rocky Marciano Price, his parents had named him after a well-known boxer. He lived with his dad and mom and five siblings in the Winnie Hill area of Accrington, a place they had called home for almost three decades. Rocky helped out on his family farm, especially taking care of the chickens, which he loved to do. Other things he also enjoyed were watching films and playing computer games, things that normal kids would like and be a part of. But Rocky wasn't considered normal to those in the outside world. Rocky was clearly somebody with challenges and with some health issues around autism. Mild autism, learning difficulties. He didn't go to mainstream school. He was not academic. Some of his teachers said that he was non-verbal or, or, or didn't speak a lot. With a below average IQ of just 65, a diagnosis of autism and ADHD had changed all that. Rocky would become a student at one of the alternative schools for individuals with special educational needs. His teachers described him as quiet and almost non-verbal most of the time. They had never seen any aggression in the boy, nor had they witnessed him becoming angry either. He had been evaluated by a psychologist in 2015. The boy had difficulty identifying emotions in others and expressing emotions of his own. Rocky had never had any run-ins with the law or any reprimands from officials. He just never got into trouble. He was quiet and reserved and kept to himself. Yet, as stated earlier, on the 12th of August 2019 at around 6.30 p.m., Rocky is captured on CCTV footage exiting the coppice on Burnley Road with his jacket unzipped, chest bare, and the knees of his track pants were wet. He didn't appear agitated. He looked like he had just been doing something other than walking. He made two trips to the coppice at 6.55 p.m. Rocky was not panicked or flustered. He just sedately walked away from the coppice after allegedly murdering Lindsay Burbeck. He calmly planned how to transport her body from the coppice to the cemetery to dispose of it. And he wasn't in a rush to do it. Rocky did not know Lindsay, even though he lived just three minutes from Lindsay's residence. They had never met before or run into each other as far as anyone knew. The attack was unprovoked, yet something had to have set him off to do the damage he had done to Lindsay's body. So, what would cause a young male to commit such a heinous crime? Was it curiosity in the most brutal way? Did something set him off? Did he just snap? Yet, he had been described as unemotional by those who had contact with him in the outside world. Were they wrong? Did something deep inside him break loose and surface in the most horrific way? Rocky's parents escorted their son to the local police station. This was after seeing him on the CCTV footage that was shown on television. It had been used by the police, appealing to the public for any information they had on the missing woman named Lindsay Burbeck. Rocky's parents were unsure as to how he was involved, but would be utterly shocked when they found out the reason. Shortly thereafter, Rocky was arrested on suspicion of the murder of Lindsay Burbeck. 
His parents were adamant that their son had not done anything wrong. Rocky was questioned over the course of days and would continually deny the responsibility of Lindsay's death. He eventually told police that a stranger had offered him a large amount of money to dispose of the body. He stuck to his story that he had not killed Lindsay. He had just moved her body. For six months, I had a sergeant and six detectives scanning all the CCTV looking for this male. At the end of the investigation, I could confidently say there was no evidence whatsoever uncovered to show this male existed uh, and there was nobody else involved in Lindsay's murder. Rocky said he had never met the man before that day and the man had not been back in contact with him since then. Rocky said the man told him the money would be left for him in the coppice where the body had first been but he did not find any money after he was finished with the job he was allegedly hired to do. Was he telling the truth or just spinning a tale? So we were in court number one at Preston and Rocky came in and he was sitting behind a, a glass screen. And his body language was, he'd slouch in his chair with his hands in his pockets. To me, it was just like he were going through a routine. He knew what was going to be the outcome. We hated being in the same room as him. The hatred we felt for him was unbelievable. To see him with that attitude made it worse. Rocky stuck to his story of not guilty of murder when he first stood trial in January of 2020. But with the evidence they had, the investigation they had done, it would only take the jury three hours to come to a verdict, guilty of murder. But just as the trial was almost over, things came to a standstill. This happened when an investigation of some random cell phone footage popped up. It stood out because it was about a man that claimed that he himself had been involved in Lindsay Burbeck's murder. So Rocky's attorneys argued that the young man could not get a fair trial due to this new information and that the footage needed to be investigated first by them before a verdict could be put into play. The first jury was released and the trial put on hold due to the new evidence. After a lengthy investigation, it was eventually determined by several investigators that the footage was false and the man had lied. The cell phone footage had nothing to do with the present Rocky Price case. A new jury was chosen and the second trial proceeded. It went on for eight days, with the jury making its decision on the verdict in just four hours this time. The outcome was guilty, just as it had been in the first trial. In my judgment, the defendant's mental disorder cannot in any way excuse or explain his actions. I have no doubt that he knew what he was doing when he killed Lindsay Burbeck and that he knew that killing her was terribly wrong, according to Justice Amanda Yip. Sentenced Rocky to life for murder in the Lindsay Burbeck case. He would have to serve a minimum of 16 years to life. Because of his age, the minimum sentence was 12 years. But because it was premeditated, as in it followed the lady before Lindsay, and because of the length of time from when Lindsay went missing to being found, the class is aggravated. So because of his age, the premeditated and the aggravated, he got 16 years minimum to life. So the chances are he will never set foot out of jail for the rest of his life, which made me feel better. After the initial 16 years, Rocky could be released if the parole board decides that he isn't a danger to the public any longer. If he is released, he will be on license or probation for the rest of his life. It is the equivalent of parole in the U.S. While some may not understand how license works in the U.K., it has been said that it's worse than being in prison. Your life isn't yours anymore. You can live in the community instead of in a prison, but you'll never be truly free. Detective Inspector Tim McDermott of the Lancashire Police was in charge of the case. He said Miss Burbeck lost her life needlessly, adding, we may never know why. 
because not only did Price deny killing her, he also claimed he moved the body for a man he didn't know. This was a lie which, thankfully, the jury saw straight through. Rocky's family were adamant that he did not do it, that he had been found guilty on circumstantial evidence, and just because he had autism did not mean he was a murderer. They insisted they had the wrong person. His mother's words echoed in the courtroom. He's my son, and he's innocent. Rocky's family haven't accepted that Rocky has killed him. They believe what he has said and that somebody else did it. Was he innocent, or was it just a heartbreaking plea from a mother begging for the life of her son? As far as autism, what could have brought about such a change in Rocky? Teachers never had a problem with him, he never had outbursts, and they had never witnessed any aggression from him. Yet his own mother was concerned about how he would cope with the world as he grew up. Had there been a rage in him that would silently and quietly brew, one study found that 15 to 18 percent of adults who have autism and intellectual disabilities showed aggression. This is not to say that all individuals with autism are aggressive or that they would go to the levels Rocky has been found guilty of. Rocky Price did something very wrong, and there is no turning back on that. One family lost a loved one to murder. Rocky's family lost a son. It was because of a horrific choice he made and the innocent life he took. I don't think it'll be possible to rebuild after this because like most mums in most families, they are a big, big person to have in your life. So it's, so it's hard not to have it there. No sentence will ever bring Lindsay back. It won't fill the void in the lives of her family. The devastation of losing their loved one will never be eased. They may have their wonderful memories of her, but no one can put their arms around a memory and hold it. Death is final, and Lindsay's senseless death should never have happened. So, what are your thoughts in this case? Is Rocky guilty? Or did he take the fall for some mystery person that has never been found? Thanks for watching. If you found this story compelling, don't forget to like the video, comment down below your take on it, and please subscribe to the channel. On your way out, don't forget to hit the notification bell in order to stay up to date each time we reveal a new shocking case. Until next time, stay safe and keep your eyes peeled. You never know what's lurking in the shadows.